This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It, it must be Monday, but it's not Monday. It's Tuesday. It must be the first business day, broadcast day of the year. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is uh, Mina Marco and me. Uh, Mina's not available, but, but Marco joins us uh, by Skype audio from the Big Island ProVision Solar. Happy New Year, Marco. Well, I can't think of a better way to start out 2018 than with my good buddy, Jay Fidel. So, uh, haoli, Marco Hikiho to you, my friend. Yeah, Xin Yin Kwai Le, may I add, yeah. So, first, before we get to our principal topic, which is all about uh, Hawaii State Energy Tax Credits in the legislative session coming soon, um, how does it look in general for energy? What is the mood in the state? What is the mood in the country on renewables these days, Marco? Got any, got any thoughts about that? Well, I think maybe a good way to start uh, on that subject is to perhaps go over some of the, the numbers. I had the opportunity to write a piece, an op-ed piece for the Star Advertiser last week looking at some of the most recent data provided by our friends at the State Department of Taxation every year about this time. Over the past years, they've been presenting uh, a report looking at the entire list of the tax credits, uh, the tax credit dollars that were effectively provided to uh, filers uh, for these various tax credits, not not in the previous calendar year because it takes some time, of course, for the state to gather all the tax returns. So uh, they were provided this report to the public, um, posted it last month, December, and it covered uh, 2015. 2015. So we'll have to wait until the end of this year to get. Uh, 2016. So I've been keeping an eye over time on the amount of uh, dollars claimed for the renewable energy tax credit. And it's uh, kind of striking now that we're reaching the point of, uh, for the four most recent years which we have data, which is 2012 to 2015, uh, Hawaii tax filers have filed for as much as um, about half a billion dollars, half a billion dollars. Uh, worth of, uh, of tax credits uh, for renewable energy in general, but the vast majority of that is for solar energy systems. Uh, and I'd say the biggest chunk of that is solar electric with a smaller chunk going to solar hot water heating, solar thermal. Mm -hmm. So half a billion or so from 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. And my estimate would be that 2016 would probably be somewhere in the 80 to 90 million range uh, claim for 2016, and I'm going to guess for 2017, somewhere in the 70 to 80 million range. So if you do the math, uh, over the past six years, 2012 to 2017, uh, the total amount claimed for the renewable energy tax credit will be probably somewhere in the 650 to 670, 100 million dollar range, which is by far the largest category in terms of tax credit dollars claimed, and there are a whole bunch of other state tax credits, but by far, by far, the renewable energy tax credit has been the biggest chunk over the past years. Just for so, comparison, at the, at the top of it, the cumulative amount that was uh, attributed to the uh, t high technology tax credits under Act 221, which existed for, I want to say, eight years. Um, was 150 million, uh, a fraction of what we're talking about for energy credits. It's interesting. And at the 150 million, the legislature had serious reservations about it. And uh, ergo, they you know, terminated it earlier. They sunset it earlier. So uh, it's interesting. It becomes politically mm, charged, uh, if you will, if I can use that term, uh, when you talk about tax credits in large amounts this way. Well, and, uh, you know, I know that over the past couple years, uh, the 2016 legislature, uh, which meets from January to May, 2017 legislature, that there were bills that made it through to the final conference committee at the very end of the session that would have modified the renewable energy tax credit, would have done at least a couple things, if my recollection is correct. Uh, it would have uh, started to ramp down the 35% renewable energy tax credit over time because right now there is no sunset date, no ramp down for that tax credit. And it also would have added uh, a specific carve out 
for battery storage. And uh, in both sessions, 2016, 2017, the bill did not make it out of conference, which meant that it did not get to the governor's desk, which means that nothing happened. Nothing uh, happened to change this tax credit uh, law, this bill, or yeah. not bill, can but we, Can uh, we the unpack tax that credit. for a minute, though? I think it's very interesting to look back at that. I know that there were members of the solar community, I mean, your industry, who were working for a ramp down of that 35%. Years ago, um, I want to say four or five years ago, and uh, I guess for some reason it was always overtaken by events and it never happened. Um, what was what was the political play on that? Uh, wh why would members of your industry wanted to have created a ramp down, and uh, who who opposed it, and why did it ultimately fail, including most recently last year? Well. Not actually having a seat at the conference committee table, uh, I can't give you firsthand uh, feedback on that, Jay, but my understanding, I mean, if you look uh, at the participants of these conference committees, uh, two of the principals are the chair of the Senate Energy and Transportation Committee, and that is my friend Senator Lorraine Inouye. And then on the House side, there's the House Energy and Environment Committee, and uh, there's my friend Chris Lee, who is the chair of that committee. And there were uh, uh, differences of opinion uh, between members of the conference committee, both in 2016 and 2017, in terms of how to proceed, that led effectively to uh, an outcome of no bill being uh, voted on uh, and passed out of conference. Mm. So. You know, I remember uh, the, the people within the industry, and I guess outside the industry, were thinking, this is back four or five years ago, that it would be a good idea to ramp it down to avoid the shock and the um, you know, d disturbance of just chopping it off at a certain point in time. Uh, and that, that, that was considered, at least by them, a more rational way to deal with uh, an increasing you know, political mm, pressure uh, to terminate or at least reduce the credits. But, um, you know, now it's an interesting, you know, your articles have been valuable. Your calculations of the, uh, the number of installations going on for the last couple of years have been very instructive. And what we see is a, de a huge decline uh, in the installation for solar. So why, why would anybody want to reduce or cut or even ramp it down at this point? Don't we need to incentivize it? Isn't, isn't uh, this 35% a good number we, which we should continue in order to continue our march to 100% renewables? Um, no, your point is well taken, Jay. I think there's a general acceptance uh, that subsidies, and of course the tax credit is a subsidy. Uh, it's a subsidy that I think has been uh, well worth it for our state in terms of the return of investment in that, as I noted in my piece, uh, the jobs created the millions of barrels of oil that were not imported into the state for power generation, and interestingly, uh, which is something I think that, that even uh, the op-ed editor at uh, the Star Advertiser sent me an email saying, are you sure about this? And she was thinking that I was making a factually incorrect statement when I said uh, Hawaii power plants burn more oil, burn more oil in our little 50th state than the rest of the continental U.S. combined. So whenever we reduce the amount of oil needing to come into the state from far, far away, that's a good thing. So I think tax credits in general have been beneficial for the state uh, overall, but that said, there's no doubt that there's been a increase in uh, mass adoption of solar, uh, solar rooftop solar uh, across the board. Prices have come down, and at some point, it's reasonable to discuss uh, and to question whether subsidies need to be maintained at at a certain level. Uh, for example, the federal investment tax credit, which has been at 30 percent uh, since 2005 under George W. Bush that at this point is scheduled to be 30% this year, 30% next year in 2019, and then starting in 2020, ramped down to 26% in 2021, ramped down to 22%, and then by 2022 to go down to 10%. So there's a overall consensus that 
these subsidies for renewable energy have have achieved their their purpose, their targeted purpose, and that it is an okay thing to do to ramp down on the level of uh, subsidization from the government trough. Now, I'm not sure I, I would agree offhand to that for Hawaii, uh, but let me just look at that for a second with you, and that is uh, we've had a we've had a serious decline in the number of installations. At the same yeah. time, we, we're moving closer, year by year, uh, to our goal of uh, 2045 or 2040, depending on who you listen to. Um, and, and so it, it, the, the goal seems to be further away, not closer, because the assumptions we were making uh, would be that solar was going to continue at the same rate. Well, tax incentives are supposed to change the way people make business decisions and personal decisions. And so uh, isn't, it, isn't it all very quite appropriate to maintain this tax credit uh, if we want to incentivize people to continue uh, you know, to, um, to install solar? And if we want to reach our 100% goal, we have to continue to incentivize. It doesn't happen by magic. So um, uh, tell me why we should cut it right now. Have we spent, our, have we spent all the low-hanging fruit and there's nothing left? Or is there plenty left? Well, I mean, that's that's the sixty-four thousand dollar now, more like sixty-four million with inflation uh, <laughs> question, Jay. In terms of how much of a market is left, how much of the low frame, low hanging mangoes have, have fallen or have been picked from the, the beautiful mango trees across the state, and that's uh, there's not a, a know-it-all definitive answer. Do that. I mean, the thing with solar is that it's different uh, compared to a normal kind of consumer items, uh, where you're going to get a bed on average, a new bed every X number of years. You got to get tires for your car. You've got to get other appliances for your house because they don't last forever. Well, there's not that kind of predictable turnover for solar PV. In other words, if you get a solar PV system on your home, you're not going to trade it in for another model in four or five or six or ten years. So. We also happen to live in a state where the highest percentage, if I'm not mistaken, the highest percentage uh, in the whole country of people live in a rental unit. So mm -hmm. that uh, kind of leads into the other interesting uh, event of the past week or so, which is the uh, Public uh, Utilities Commission, the PUC, uh, signed off on uh, moving forward with the custom Community-Based Renewable Energy, or CBRE for short. That will allow, uh, in in reality, uh, if and when, not if, I shouldn't be so pessimistic, that when it's implemented and executed, that uh, folks who are renters will be able to essentially enjoy uh, fractional ownership uh, and the benefits of a PV system somewhere else on the grid. Why has it taken so long for them to come around to that? Community Solar has been on the books for a couple of years already. Well, it was passed by the 2015 legislature. It was signed by the governor sometime, I believe, July of 2015. Now we're the beginning of 2018, and the commission has put out a decision and order uh, on uh, a CBRE program, and the uh, utility companies, the Hawaiian Electric Companies and KIUC on Kauai have a number of days to respond in terms of how they're going to go ahead and implement this program. but. I'm, uh, I have my misgivings in terms of how soon this is going to be ready for prime time. I think back to the, the feed-in tariff, the FIT, which was the subject of years' worth of discussion in the legislature, and finally uh, went live December 2011. And uh, in my opinion, FIT has been largely a fiasco. It's been uh, detrimental to ratepayers. It's benefited a small number of investors who are guaranteed a, a revenue stream of 20 years getting premium pricing from renewable energy as renewable energy has gone down in price feeding into the grid and has been relatively uh, uh, not a, a real good thing. So compared to the FIT, CBRE, I think, is, is I won't say infinitely more complicated, but simple, certainly more complicated in execution by many orders of magnitude compared to FIT. Yeah, that's so the problem. So I think uh, you know, in, in, in principle, CBRE, Community-Based Renewable Energy, is a great idea. It's a really cool idea, and I salute people like Mike Gabbard, Senator Gabbard, who was behind it two-plus uh, two years ago. But I really wonder how uh, its execution is going to be in in the real world. There's just so much, and I keep on going back to you know, my metaphor of turbulence. The, the turbulence uh, 
uh, you know, on the national level in terms of the political situation, the energy situation, uh, and in our own state is just so so dramatic. And so, I mean, compared to when you and I were younger guys, Jay, uh, when I started here in PV 20-some-odd years ago, I mean, things are just so much more complicated now. Isn't that Maybe true? that's kind of life in general. I don't know. That's, do that's absolutely true, Marco. Things are more complicated, and they're likely to be more complicated in 2018. Let's take a, a short break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about, hmm, for example, uh, whether Hawaii should adopt the same step-down uh, schedule that the feds have. We'll also talk about uh, storage, because we need to talk about tax credits for storage, that second bill that failed last year. We'll be right back with Marco Mangelsdorf here on Mina Marco and Me on Energy on a Monday, which has become a New Year's Tuesday. We'll be right Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself to you can find yourself. Okay, we're back in 2018 with uh, uh, Mina, Marco, and me. Marco Mangelsdorf joins us by Skype from ProVision Solar in Hilo. We're talking about tax credits in 2018 and beyond. So yeah, you mentioned the step-down procedure, the step-down schedule that the feds have all the way into the 20s. And I want, you know, that sounded like a reasonable step-down schedule. Um, is, is that worth considering here? Uh, we copy so much from, the, say, the Internal Revenue Code or at least as it used to be, in state tax, uh, why don't we just copy that schedule in state tax on energy? I guess uh, if I had my druthers, I would choose to have the state renewable energy tax credit to not be on the same identical schedule as the federal ITC ramp down, just because I prefer, uh, you know, as a... Uh, parochially minded, uh, self-interested business owner who does solar electric to not uh, suffer from a double whammy in each year. So I guess, uh, you know, if I had my, my preference, I would push out a uh, ramp down of the state tax credit uh, a little bit longer, farther out there, uh, and not have it be uh, synchronous with, with the federal ITC ramp down. Mm. Yeah, and the other, I would add one thought is that, um this administration is unpredictable, or maybe it's predictably unpredictable. Before you know it, we're going to be cutting out a lot of programs, and uh, who knows what will happen uh, to the tax credit. Uh, was it affected by the Tax Reform Act? If not, you know, maybe it will be any time in the future. So if we assume that that schedule will continue to apply, that may not be a valid assumption. Well, I do know that uh, when the, the tax reform uh, bill was in play, there was some discussion uh, about some rule changes or interpretation changes regarding the federal investment tax credit uh, without having actually read that, uh, what is it, I think, a thousand plus page bill that uh, the President Trump signed. Uh, my understanding is that the ITC essentially uh, did make it through intact. Mm -hmm. Now, to the also important question as to whether it's going to stay that way. Uh, I think there is more of a across the aisle bipartisan support for renewable energy, which has typically, at least recently, been more supported by Democrats versus Republicans in Congress. I think there is more of a bipartisan level of support uh, from both sides. And you're always going to have the outliers in both parties. But uh, at this point, I'm not overly concerned that the ITC is going to be messed with 
uh, in the Congress, at least uh, in the, in the near term. I think their focus are much more uh, higher priority items. Uh, uh, concurrent uh, resolutions or continuing resolutions to be able to fund the federal government, uh, come up with a, uh, a budget that's going to pass, uh, Social Security, Medicare uh, reform, and so forth. So I think they're much bigger fish to fry. So hopefully the federal investment tax credit will be uh, not in the, uh, the crosshairs of uh, opponents of, uh, of renewable energy. And one of the things I mentioned in my piece, which I'll, I'll mention or reiterate to you, Day is the, the notion that renewable energy is unfairly or unjustifiably subsidized and should stand on its own is, is a really completely bogus and specious argument because according to the research I've done over the years, and this is all public data, renewable energy has been supported by federal and state subsidies, there's no doubt about that, but compared to conventional energy sources from oil, coal, Nat gas, nuclear, hydro; those other sources receive have received on average ten dollars for every single dollar the renewable, renewable energy has uh, has been provided. So, mm. you know, there's no such thing as a level playing field in energy. There's just too much attendant uh, power and influence. So, I think uh, it's reasonable that the renewable energy should be uh, should be subsidized and has been subsidized over the years. Yeah, I hope you're right. I, I do worry, uh, you know, the, the Tax Reform Act passed in the last few days of 2017, uh, and it wasn't a week until this morning Paul Ryan is talking now about taking the wings out of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, uh, because there won't be enough money. So the Republicans, uh, you know, they make, they make it so that we have less money because they reduce taxes for so many people, especially the wealthy. Um, and once they reduce taxes, it's, oh, gee whiz, we don't have enough money. And we have to find right. more sources of uh, revenue. We're going to cut back on Social Security. Now, they may have a real resistance problem on that because a, a lot of people in this country, including the base, if you will, um, need Social Security. I mean, a lot of people need Social Security. And they're going to fight really hard to keep Social Security. AARP is, I'm sure, already gearing up for that. It'll be a big fight. Now, if the administration fails, as it did in health care, uh, then the administration is going to have to look for other sources of revenue, make up for the shortfall represented by the Tax Reform Act of 2017. When they do that, they'll be looking for everything. Uh, they're looking through the tax code, looking for through the social safety net to find m sources of money. So it may be that nothing will be exempt at that time. It'll be a, it'll be a squeeze. But uh, I, did, I did want to move on, though, um, to the whole notion of storage. Because um, storage is becoming, has become already, a couple of years ago anyway, part and parcel of, of, of PV and for that renewables in general uh, that are, you know, that are, that are not uh, what firm. And, um, and we have to have storage if we're going to proceed to our 100 percent here and anywhere else in the country. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, it was a surprise to me that the legislature couldn't get its act together uh, last session, last year on including the credit for storage, storage facilities, batteries, and the like. Um, and that's, that was really uh, too bad. So what's, what's the atmosphere like on that issue now, Marco? It's a big question. Well, I don't think it's, it's not completely accurate to say the legislature couldn't get its act together. I think it's more specific to uh, a number of legislators who couldn't get enough on the same page to be able to get something to the governor's desk. So uh, I have no doubt that on um, both the House and Senate side, there will be bills introduced that will probably try very similarly, if not identically, to uh, do what uh, they failed to do or what, what was failed to accomplish uh, last year in terms of uh, a bill that will include a ramp down of the state renewable energy tax credit and uh, also carve out a new category, uh, state tax credit for energy storage apart from, uh, from solar. And the likelihood of it getting through to the end and going to conference committee, I, I think is probably reasonable to say it's probably pretty high, probably pretty high. 
Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, we'll have to wait. Essentially, and we're you know we're, we're May. No, sorry, we're, we're January second, and the conference committee conference committees will meet the first week or so in May. So we're five months away, essentially, from from knowing uh, what's going to happen. And in a sense, you know, the January, February, March, April are all foreplay in a sense. Uh, and uh, we we wait and see what's going to come get into conference and what, if anything, is going to come out of the conference committee. So, well, let me, let me make uh, you the conference committee for a minute. Uh, you know, what are the policy points for and against uh, storage? Should storage be linked with the, uh, you know, the existing tax credit? Should it be a separate tax credit for separate installations? And what kind of dollars and cents or percentages uh, would you like to see adopted? I mean, I know you're in the solar industry, but, you know, looking at it from the 50,000-foot level, what, what's an appropriate amount of credit in order to, uh, you know, bring us closer to the 100% uh, target? We probably, it should be stipulated that uh, storage is only tax creditable, per se, if it, is, if it is charged by renewable energy. In other words, not charged by the grid. So I think that needs to be a stipulation uh, in whatever bill were to come out. Uh, in terms of what the amount should be, I mean, there's no way I don't think it could be higher than 35%. I think symbolically that we have an existing 35% renewable energy tax credit, so I don't think 40%, 45%, 50% or more is probably sellable but just from a, uh, from a common sense standpoint. So if it were to be somewhere in the 20 to 35% range for storage, I think that would certainly be... Uh, acceptable uh, to to the solar parties. Not that I speak for for them, but uh, you know, um, uh, Mina wasn't able to join us. Mina Marita, I'll, I'll kind of channel for Mina if I may be so bold, and I think Mina would say, uh, no, enough already. That there has been already substantial government uh, subsidization and support for renewable energy, and that if you include battery storage as a part of a new PV system, you can. You can, in fact, get uh, a tax credit for that. So uh, there, there is that, that side of the, the, the argument that says, enough already. There's been adequate subsidization already. But that, that view would that view would, would leave, that that view would leave all the people behind. Down, and that, that view there are would leave all the people behind, Marco. For public funds and that the renewable energy is just one amongst the number. I mean, and, and, and that's a very valid argument. I mean, that, well, is it really? Because that view would leave uh, all the people behind the who have already here, uh, as well as you know, continuing issues in education and uh, caring for our kupuna. So, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. There's not enough money available to do everything we want it to do, right? So, well, yeah, but we, uh, you know, uh, that's what the legislature gets paid to do, right? To make hard choices from a limited pot of money, and then you throw in the fact that we're in election year now. We've got. Colleen Hanabusa challenging an incumbent governor, kind of rerun, redux of 20, 2014 with, with David Ige challenging Neil Abercrombie. So, you know, what is an election year going to throw into the mix? Uh, it's it's going to be uh, going to be an interesting ride, I'm sure. Well, that view, uh, you know, do you agree with Mina Marita's view on that? I Or the view you would construct for her? Because, in fact, that would leave all the people behind who have solar, uh, and who did not, uh, you know, use storage, um, did not spend the money, and would spend the money now only in aid of renewable energy. Uh, it seems logical that you would allow them to do it for old installations just as for new ones. What's, what's the policy point that would disting, distinguish uh, old installations from new ones and exclude them? Well, that's, that's a great question, and uh, I do know that there uh, are efforts afoot from a number of parties to essentially get clarification from the Internal Revenue Service, our friends at the IRS, in terms of, and conceivably, someone who has a PV system, like me, for example, I have a NEM, a NEM system on my house, if I were to add battery storage that is only charged by solar, in other words, not by the grid, would I, should I qualify uh, my purchase of additional uh, of buying battery storage, not adding any more PV, but just battery storage, should, should that qualify for the investment tax credit? Is that in line with the letter and the spirit of the law, the statute on the books? 
right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we in the industry are waiting uh, excitedly, at least speaking for myself, for greater clarification from the IRS regarding that really important question about being able to retrofit battery storage for existing grid tie customers. Uh, and so what's the benefit other than, let's say, me having a power wall, a Tesla power wall, and I can have backup power if the grid goes down? Well, we are moving collectively into uh, you know, the, the, the smart grid present and future, even though I have, uh, I have issues with the, the smart grid moniker. But part of the smart grid is supposed to be where you've got battery storage systems across the grid, which are providing so-called grid services in support of the utility company in support of the grid writ large. So it's not just the selfishness of Marco or my neighbor who wants to get battery storage added to their NEM system, but over time, having batteries placed by the thousands across a service territory should be able to give greater resilience and robust uh, reliability to to a grid. And, you know, I think I afforded you that piece from the New York Times a few days ago, Jay, where 50% of the people in Puerto Rico, 50%, 5-0, are still without power now more than four months after Hurricane Maria clobbered that island's infrastructure. I mean, uh, is the Big Island the same as Puerto Rico? No. Is Oahu the same as Puerto Rico? Probably not. But at the same time, you know, look what happened to, to Kauai, 1992 Hurricane Aniki. Okay, so we're going to have to continue this conversation. There's a public good by having battery storage across a utility service territory. And if, if we can do that and, and speed that with having some type of grid or some type of uh, Credit, tax credit from the state to do that. I think that an argument can be made to legislators that that is a public good that needs to be supported. Marco, we're out of time. Uh, we need to continue this conversation. I have more questions I want to put to you, and certainly we need to follow what happens in the legislature. Happy New Year, Marco. Xin Yin Kwai Le. And I look forward to our next discussion. It will be on a Monday, two weeks from yesterday. Uh, thank you so much, Marco. Aloha.